Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Yin, for the invitation and for bringing us here. And I also just wanted to say thank you at the beginning to three friends and colleagues um, <coughs> who have really benefited from talking with about these ideas. They are Pine Sale Panya in Phnom Penh, David Chandler in Melbourne, and Klai Rang Amrati in Bangkok. Okay, so the purpose of this paper um, is to try to think about how um, modern Khmer novels from the 1960s might be approached as sources of information, interpretation, and theorization of aesthetics and attitudes in Cambodia at that time, especially relating to the city and to various forms of modern artistic practice that gathered in the city. And my desire to think about Khmer literature in this way is informed by two observations. The first is practical. There is scant critical commentary in Khmer on modern arts or architecture from this period. Thus, it is necessary to look to other kinds of contextual sources, such as novels, in an attempt to historicize various forms of visual culture. But the second observation driving me to consider Khmer novels and visual culture as being mutually illuminating is my sense, and I think this, this echoes Ian's comments um, earlier this afternoon, my sense that the intersections within and between media were frequent and fundamental to the creation and reception of meaning in modern Cambodian arts during the decades before 1975. And moreover, I would suggest that these transmedia intersections, including a course between the textual and the visual, provide a rich vein for art historical analysis. This possibility has been comparatively underexplored, and I would suggest that the emerging institutions in the region today seem to be often having a hard time coming to grips with it. So before I introduce some specific examples from Khmer literature, let me first quote from a critical pedagogical text which has guided my approach to modern Khmer literature. What is it that we call literature? It is words that are the voice of our inner emotions. It is a kind of knowledge that shares discussions through letters, using an artfulness to make it sound lovely and interesting for the reader. In order to make our study of literature useful, we must study literature in connection to civilization. That is, whatever we study about literature, we will study about people. There are three key points that I'd like to draw out in this passage. Firstly, literature is a kind of knowledge that shares discussions. That is, the author, Kuhn Sakong, situates the literary in an active relationship to other forms of discourse, other kinds of knowledge and other discussions. Secondly, the author emphasizes his interest in the aesthetic qualities of literature, its artfulness that is lovely and interesting. And thirdly, the author positions the reader as central to the understanding of literature. Kuhn Sakom's curriculum, which I'm quoting from here, has long since fallen into obscurity and to my knowledge has not been cited in any previous studies of Khmer literature in Khmer, English or French. But here I will try to heed his suggestions, including especially for the study of modern Khmer literature in relation to culture and society. To be sure, Sakom's words echo those of numerous others coming before him, especially literary critics in Europe and North America writing in the early and mid 20th century. And although this text is written in Khmer, the author did also write and circulate in both Anglophone and Francophone settings during the 1960s <coughs> and 1970s, including publishing an essay in the Journal of the Siam Society, which is still cited by linguists today. Yet I'm choosing to take Kuhn Sakong as my guide here, rather than any of the European or North American textualists which undoubtedly influenced him, as part of an effort to situate my approach in a local e discourse and specifically in the Khmer language. As a gesture towards de-imperializing theory, this is insufficient, and I recognize that. But as an attempt toward understanding the network of discourses that circulated in the Cambodian and especially the Khmer setting during this period, perhaps it may be of some modest use. Before I continue, I should briefly mention um, that the period in question um, that I'll talk about today centers on the two decades between national independence, achieved in 1953, and the devastation wreaked by Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge after 1975. These two decades marked an extraordinary flourishing in modern arts and culture in Cambodia, 
much, although not all, of it under the patronage of the former king turned prince and head of state, Nora Domsi Hanuk. He relentlessly instrumentalized the arts in the service of his regime's ideology, known in Khmer as the Sankumri Riyum, a name usually translated as People's Socialist Community. Political developments leading to and following national independence were closely matched by artistic developments. The approximately concurrent appearance within two decades between the late 1930s and the late 1950s of the first Khmer modern novels, the first realist easel paintings made by Cambodians, the first Cambodian designed modern concrete architecture, and the first Cambodian made films is an extraordinary concentration of historically new artistic forms. It is also best understood through the mutually informing relationships within and between these various forms, as I'll try to demonstrate. The devastation wrought by the Khmer Rouge from 1975 to 1979, killing between one-fifth and one-quarter of the nation's population, including an estimated 80 to 90 percent of all artists, writers and intellectuals, casts an inescapable shadow over all subsequent research. Paying attention to the transmedia intersections during the preceding decades before 1975, as I do today, is one way to counter the methodological challenges posed by the loss and dispersal of lives, artworks, and archives. So I turn now to the first of a few examples, and I'll begin not with a novel, but with these two paintings, which are believed to survive only in reproduction. They are among only a small handful of known images of easel paintings made before 1975, which depict the modern city. This fact alone makes them significant for reconstructing an art history of this place at this time, yet no textual sources on either image has been found. As you can see, both paintings depict a cyclo, a kind of pedalled rickshaw, and the work by Nyakdem on the right um, also shows us some iconic examples of post-independence architecture in Phnom Penh, such as the Independence Monument designed by Van Molly Van and the Naga Fountain designed by Louis Van Hau. Various archival records indicate that a good number of other artists, in addition to these two, also painted the newly, newly constructed buildings of the modern city, but all of these have been lost. Of the few hundred paintings from this period before 1975 that are known to survive, the vast majority depict rural landscapes. Thus, these two images take on a special importance as privileged insights into how Cambodians saw and depicted their city during the time of its rapid transformation. But it is only by looking to novels from this period that the contextual and connotative meanings associated with the city, the new cityscape, and with the cyclo begin to come into view. The first modern Khmer novel about a cyclo was the one on the left, and it seems to have served as a model for many others that followed, such as the one on the right. So I'm talking about the one on the left now. Um, in 1961, a man named Sun Sorin published this novel, titled A New Sun Rises Over the Old Land, or in Khmer, Pre Atat Mei Rehle Pindai Cha. It was the inaugural winner of a new literary prize, which Sihanouk established for this purpose, and it went on to be the best-selling Khmer novel ever, a position it continued to enjoy for several decades. It remains widely read and prescribed in schools and universities today, and is canonical within the Khmer-speaking world. A great many other novels pub subsequently published in the 1960s, at least two dozen that I'm aware of, and probably more, also centred on characters who drove sea clothes. The profession of sea clothes driving was described as being physically exhausting and risky, as well as especially economically precarious. The poverty and hardship encountered by cyclo drivers and by their families was described in great detail in many of these novels, usually as a central component of a critique of social and economic inequality in the transforming modern city. Novels, as these, such, novels such as these thus provide a fascinating way to make sense of paintings of cyclos. With an understanding of the simultaneously admirable and pitiable position of the cyclo driver, as described through literature, and importantly only through literature, we can read paintings such as these as celebrating the heroic labour of the, the cyclo drivers. Their masculine vitality may be seen as perhaps a symbol for that of the new nation. Yet importantly, the novels did not only lament the hardships endured by the cyclo drivers, but they also some, uh, celebrate the many transformations in the cityscape awestruck descriptions of new roads, modern architecture, cinemas and nightclubs, as well as electrification, 
abound in novels of this period. This recurrent emphasis on depicting the transforming urban environment in novels of the period, as well as in paintings like these, may be understood as both a literal and an allegorical commentary on the nature of the modern. In Khmer, one of the most commonly used words for modern is domneur, which may be literally translated as recentness. So I try to adopt this sense of recentness as an analytic trope. Looking at both of these paintings, we can notice the newly electrified lampposts and power lines visible in the background, as well as in Yekdom's painting, the identifiable modern architectural landmarks, which were recently constructed, but redeploy and Corian aesthetic forms. The historically new form of transport that is the Ciclo is, vi is visually and also rhetorically linked to the historically recent transformations in the urban landscape. So I should focus now to a second category of examples, also related to the urban environment. A generic convention found in many modern Khmer novels is to open with the description of the protagonist's house. This originates as early as 1943 with uh, a now canonical novel called The Rose of Bailin by New York Time, which is uh, one of the first modern Khmer novels ever published. It opens with a poetic account of the protagonist's house, which it describes as, and I quote, a Cambodian house of the Boran style that still remains in the current era. And Boran is a Khmer word of Sanskrit origin, which can mean classical, ancient, traditional, or pre-modern. Um, even in this very brief description, we can discern the centrality, firstly, of Cambodian nationalism, um, also of the sense that we have moved, we've shifted from a classical time to a new era, a current era, and finally the coevality of new and old forms that together make up this current era. Close readings of selected passages from numerous novels reveal that houses function as symbols of the character as well as class of their inhabitants. Studying literary descriptions of, arch uh, of architecture enriches our understanding of the daily experience of urban, urban, of urban modernity, while also complementing our understanding of modern Cambodian building designs by architects like Van Molyvan and others. <coughs> With that in mind, I'll turn now to a novel titled Where Is My Daughter? or In Khmer Aina Kon Sarai Knyom. It was first published in 1962, so the year after the novel about the sequel by Suen Sorin that we saw earlier. So let me read the opening lines. 15 January 1962, in the evening. Mr. Somret, a professor of economics, drove his Mercedes car quickly out of the Chongkamon area, turning north into Monivong Boulevard. He had just finished teaching at the University of Law and was hurrying home because tonight his wife was not in the house. She had left the Kompong Chenang very early this morning. Somret's house is to the west of Wat Ka Pagoda at number 345. It is a beautiful home with the grand classic style of the Cambodian heritage, combined very well with the most modern kind of international style that is popular all over the world today. So typically, typical of, of the Khmer um, genre, the novel opens with a description of its protagonist's house. After providing the exact date in which we are to imagine the action taking place, the opening paragraph introduces us to the protagonist, Sombret, by situating him in the very specific spatial as well as class position in modern Phnom Penh. The precision of details recalls the philosopher Charles Taylor's comments about what he calls the modern novel's, quote, portrayal of the particular. Charles Taylor observes that the genre of modern novels, quote, narrates the lives of particular people in their detail. And Taylor suggests that this marks an important shift that makes novels distinctly modern and able to articulate a modern sense of self. So to go back to this passage, in it once introducing us to the protagonist, Samrit, and to the city in which the action will primarily take place, this opening passage suggests that the man is shaped by his urban life. One detail in the passage warrants special attention for its ability to illuminate descriptions of urban space in other kinds of Cambodian arts, including paintings and especially architecture. It is the description of Somerset's house as at once faithful to the grand classic style of the Cambodian heritage, yet also in sync with the most modern kind of international style. The modern here does not displace the pre-modern, but rather redeploys it. Old and new forms are co-evil. The Khmer and the cosmopolitan are coexisting. 
Indeed, this novel, this is a novel in which seemingly opposing worlds, the urban and the rural, the internationally cosmopolitan modern and the Cam Cambodian Boran or classical, intersect and become intertwined. This novel is a story centering on two male characters, <coughs> Somrat, who we've met in the opening passage, and Wisset, who's also a professor, but of literature. Um, the description of Somrat's house that we saw a moment ago lays the basis for his characterization. But a study of the description of the second protagonist's house belonging to Wisset is equally revealing, not only of Wisset's character, but also of attitudes to a dramatically changing Phnom Penh at that time. So I'll quote that passage. We set rented his house, which was an apartment upstairs of number 41A, on the left side of Kampodia Kram Boulevard when travelling towards the Bzar Tom Tomei market. To enter the house, he must walk along a small path, a laneway, and then climb a, small then climb a staircase that is set entered from the rear. We set only began renting this house around <coughs> four years ago, that is, after he came to, to live alone as an orphan and started work as a professor of Khmer literature in the great nation of Cambodia University. In Wisset's neighbourhood, there are not very many ethnic Khmer, and most people are Vietnamese and Chinese, but these foreigners speak Khmer very well and even know how to speak about Cambodian culture too. As with the description of Somret's house, the specific and precise naming of Wisset's address allows the reader to imagine that this is a real house in the real city of Phnom Penh. Significantly, although Wisset's house is very different from Somret's, they are located just a few hundred metres from each other. The streets that they each live on actually intersect. Somrits and Wisset's geographical proximity to one another has several important implications. Firstly, that their houses are so different and yet so close together demonstrates that Phnom Penh's urban fabric during this period encompassed significant architectural and spatial diversity within a single neighbourhood could be found both modernist villas with gardens on wide boulevards, that is Somrat's house that we saw earlier, as well as high density shop house apartments along narrow laneways, as in Wisset's house that we're seeing described here. This heterogeneous nature of the city's central neighbourhoods is at odds with the colonial attempt to create an ethnically zoned capital, which in Van Molivan, uh, as Van Molivan described, Quote, the protectorate city was desired, divided into three different districts, aligned from north to south, and identified with the ethnic groups which inhabited each district, end quote. This heterogeneous nature of the, of the, the city during the post-independence period also suggests a more nuanced, balanced, and realistic view of the Songkum era city than that which is conveyed in the idealizing vistas of Si Hanok's films. Marshall Berman has described, quote, a collective impersonal drive that seems to be endemic to modernization, the drive to create a homogenous environment, a totally modernized space in which the look and feel of the old world have disappeared without a trace. But these examples from the novel Where Is My Daughter reveal that this Berman's characterization does not hold true in the Cambodian modern in which new and old, cosmopolitan and Khmer were layered and interwoven within a single house and a single neighbourhood. A second implication of Samrat and Wisset um, living so close to one another has to do with the nature of modern urban life and its representation. We are told that Wisset had lived in his apartment for four years before he ever crossed paths with Samrat that strangers can have such unrelated and yet intersecting lives in the modern city has often been characterised as a recurring preoccupation of the modern novel in many languages. Benedict Anderson pithily describes this narrative conceit as, quote, a complex gloss on the word meanwhile, reliant on a new conceptualization of simultaneity, end quote. Seeing this complex gloss on the word meanwhile dramatised in novels from the period we may also imaginatively speculate about what possible relationships the seemingly disconnected and shadowy figures in Yeptem's painting here might have within this newly anonymous imagining of urban life. A third effect of Samret and Wisset, both living in central Phnom Penh, is of course to project an imagined picture of life there, in an area which in many ways embodied Sihanouk's and the Songkhum's projected image of urban sophistication. As representative, representatives of the epicentre of the modern city, 
It is telling that Samarit and Wiset are both professors, who both live in new kinds of houses, albeit different kinds, and who both enjoy exotic furnishings and exotic foods. Sophisticated cosmopolitan life, as represented in Khmer literature, canapes, canapé chairs, nightclubs, imported cars, and so on, also, importantly, centred on an appreciation of modern arts. Both of these characters, and many others like them in other novels of the period, regularly go to the cinema, attend performances, and in Where Is My Daughter, the novel Where Is My Daughter, pages upon pages are devoted to detailed descriptions of Wisset's Khmer literature lessons um, as taught at the university. And there are various quite explicit intertextual references to other novels in both Khmer and French. Yet notably, despite this kind of focus on other forms of modern <coughs> art, visual arts, and especially painting, are surprisingly nearly completely absent from novels of this period. So novels tell us that urban life was something that was embraced in various complex ways, which is a realisation that we may not have been able to glean from modern paintings since so few survive which depict the modern city. But novels also suggest to us that paintings were nowhere near as prominent in the imaginary representation of the city as were other forms of modern art. So having considered the effect of Samarit and Wisset's houses being located close by to each other, I want to now turn to the specificities um, of Wisset's house. Um, the, the quote highlighted in red, <clears throat> to enter the house he must walk along a small path, a laneway, and then climb a staircase that is entered from the rear. The concentration of descriptive data here suggests that this is important in conveying connotative meaning, and also that it was something of a novelty at the time. Indeed, large-scale apartment living emerged only in Cambodian's post-independence era. Van Mollivan would later describe the construction of multi-storey apartments in 1963, so the following year, as being a new experiment proposing a new type of urban housing for Cambodia. Narrow alleyways leading to, leading to elevated apartments had obviously been familiar in neighbouring countries, especially Vietnam, for much longer, in Vietnam since at least the early colonial period. And indeed, even the terminology used to describe such urban spaces in Khmer is borrowed from Vietnamese. The passage quoted here somewhat redundantly explains that we must walk, we, we must, that, that, quote, we must walk along a small path, a laneway, so small path is my literal translation or direct translation of a simple Khmer term. But the parenthesized word for laneway, Plo Duong Haim, is a Khmer loan word taken from the Vietnamese word Duong Haim. After this seemingly exotic mode of entering Wisset's apartment has been described, the passage continues to characterize his neighbors. In Wisset's neighborhood, um, there were not very many ethnic Khmer, and most people are Vietnamese and Chinese, but these foreigners speak Khmer very well. This linking of the unfamiliar architectural and urban features of Wisset's apartment with the predominance of immigrant Vietnamese and Chinese neighbours suggests that the spatial diversity in the Songkhom era city was matched by an ethnic diversity which the colonial zoning had failed to eradicate. We've already been told by this point in the novel that Wisset's close and friendly relationship with these diverse neighbours was key to his affection for his home. Um, in fact, um, the author tells us that the hard-working professor, Wisset, was bothered every night by the loud noise coming from a nightclub nearby to his house, a nightclub called the Night Nest. He was bothered, in fact, to the point of considering moving house, but he decided against leaving because, and I quote, his neighbours here loved and appreciated him very much, and he didn't want to leave them." End quote. One of Wisset's neighbours regularly prepares and serves him delicious food, as was customary for unmarried men at, at the time who could afford it. And his, uh, various of his neighbours also deliver messages for him, and in other ways participate in Wisset's daily life. Again, these various details in the novel tell us that urban life was embraced in various ways during this era, yet the embrace was not unconditional. The Night Nest nightclub, which had bothered Wisset so much, is a fitting place to conclude this paper. While the urbane pleasures of Wisset's daily life suggest ways of apprehending the experience of the city life as cosmopolitan and diverse, adding nuance to the representations found in Sihanouk's propagandistic films or in the few paintings from the period, the descriptions of Wisset's disdain for the Night Nest nightclub 
point to the ways in which um, youth culture in urban space was associated specifically with female promiscuity and moral decline. In a particularly flamboyant outburst about the night, night nest nightclub and the young women who he imagines populate it, we set says, anything that is removed from the national character, it's all the modern international trends. Any girl who is immodest, who goes through more husbands than anyone else, and who dances better than anyone else, they are all honored as being modern girls of the international trend. And they, when they go too far as modern girls of the international trend, they become strippers or actors in pornographic films, like people in the Stone Age who didn't yet know how to wear clothes. We said subjection to the modern and to modern girls is at last articulated in explicit terms. He regards the modern and international as being synony synonymous with female sexual promiscuity and deviance. The likening of sex work to people in the Stone Age posits modernity not as progress, but rather as regression. And it recalls colonial disparagement of modern day Cambodians as depraved and debased, fallen from the heights of their, of their Angkorian ancestors. But even in this moment of outburst, Wisset's disdain for modernity is ambivalent in important ways. After this outburst, a clock chimes, like the quintessential symbol of modernity. We set sees that it's almost time for dinner. Not wishing to continue his outburst, lest it ruin his guests' enjoyment of his meal, we set decides to change the subject. Significantly, he chooses to ask his guests about his work abroad in Saigon, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and about what interests him in modern Phnom Penh. So at this point, we should recall that Wisset has um, admired Somret's house, which was described in the novel's opening passage as having the Cambodian heritage, yet being most modern. And we should also recall that Wisset is attached to his own modern style of apartment living. There's clearly a pattern here. These details, as well as Wisset's choice of modern Phnom Penh as an uncontroversial and inoffensive topic of dinner conversation after his outburst about the Nout Club, reveal that the literature professor character's disdain of modern girls does not extend to a dislike for the modern city. So to conclude, this is a city in which new kinds of architecture and housing, as well as new kinds of transport like the Ciclo, are central to the experience of daily life. But this experience of modern daily urban life is an experience that we can most fully apprehend only by attending to intersections between literature and other modern artistic forms. Thanks. Thank you, Roger.